What I want to do today is kind of give an overall view of how I look at inflammaging and also to give you an idea of the direction that uh, my research is going. As Lakindra said, is uh, in the last few years, we've been focusing on uh, the role of, as you'll find out, necroptosis potentially in inflammaging. So to start out, I'd like to point out is that uh, in the past 10 years, we've identified various pathways, molecular pathways that appear to be important in aging. And one of those is inflammation. In fact, in the last decade, uh, inflammation has gotten to play somewhat of a central role in the sense that not, it's believed to be not only important in aging and age-related diseases, but may be involved in a variety of, of the pathways that are uh, proposed to be important in aging. Uh, one of the things that's been recognized over the past decade is that most mammalian species that have been studied show an increase in chronic low-grade sterile inflammation. And by that, it's inflammation that is occurring that's not in response to an infectious disease. And the term that's being used now to describe this is inflammaging. And so this is an example of data that shows uh, this effect of increase in inflammation. Here we're measuring various cytokines, uh, CRP and fibrogenum that are markers of inflammation. And as you can see that we're looking at it in men and women at very ages from 20 to over 85. And you can see that these markers increase with age. And one of the markers that's often used is IL-6. And you can see this consistently increases uh, relatively dramatically with increasing age. Not only do these markers increase with age, but if you look at, for example, IL-6, circulating IL-6 levels, these are associated with frailty that uh, is one of the conditions that we see in older individuals as well. So we know that there is this increase in inflammation and it's been observed to be a major risk factor for morbidity and mortality in the elderly. But important, that's oftentimes goes unrecognized, but this could play a very important role in age-related diseases, ranging from cancer to heart disease, to diabetes, to uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, this increase in chronic inflammation uh, that we see with age could play a role in these diseases because it's well known that in inflammation is a major factor in many of these diseases. So the two major questions in this area that I feel uh, are, occur is what is the mechanism or pathway that's responsible for inflammation? And the second one is, is this increase in chronic low-grade inflammation causing aging? or age-related diseases. Uh, we know that it's associated, but is it causal? Now, what I'm going to be talking today uh, are, is more about the mechanism. What are the pathways? And we're at a point where maybe we can start altering those pathways. So in the next five years, we might have data to indicate, is it causal, in, in age, uh, causal uh, with respect to aging? So at the present time, there are four kind of sources or pathways of inflammation. Uh, they range from immunosenescence, in other words, the age-related decline in uh, uh, the immune system has been proposed to play a role. Coagul coagulation, clotting uh, is a, a factor involved in inflammation. One area that has gotten a great deal of interest in the last uh, five years is the possibility that age-related changes in the microbiome could be important in, in aging. What I'm going to talk about are two areas that I think are possibly uh, the leading uh, pathways involved in inflammation, and that is cellular senescence and the role of uh, damage-associated molecular patterns, or DAMPs. And I'm going to first talk about cellular senescence uh, and because uh, I, I was told that uh, many of you are not uh, card-carrying aging people, so I want to give you a little bit of history on, on cellular senescence. 
uh, so that you have an idea of what it's all about, because this has gotten to be one of the leading areas of aging research that could play an important role in variety of age related diseases. So, cellular senescence was discovered by Lynn Hayfleck almost uh, uh, 60 years ago in the early 1960s. And what he found was that if he took uh, uh, fibroblasts from lung tissue or other tissues, uh, they would only divide a limited number of time. Now, we all think of that as kind of, oh, hum, that's no big deal. But it was a big deal back then because previously, primarily work from Alexis Car Cariel uh, had shown that if you took uh, cells from embryonic chick heart, they, he claimed that they would divide consistently forever. They weren't immortal, but they were just regular cells and they would consistently divide. And that was believed until uh, uh, Len Hayflick showed in uh, the 60s that if you took uh, uh, somatic cells, primary cultures of cells from tissues, they would divide for a certain number of times divisions, and then they would stop dividing. Um, it was believed that the original that uh, Carroll's problem was that when he changed or passage the cells, he would introduce new cells to it, and that's why he felt that they were continuously dividing. But if you prevent that, you're going to find that in fibroblasts and other uh, cell types is, uh, uh, that, that are somatic cells, they'll divide a certain number of times and then they'll stop dividing. They undergo irreversible exit from the cell cycle. And so this exit from the cell cycle prevents them from dividing, but they are viable for years and years after that. They essentially don't die. Uh, so this term senescence is a little bit misleading because you kind of think it's the cells are getting older and they die. In other words, it basically means that they stop dividing. And so initially it was thought this is a, a feature of dividing cells and it has no relationship to post mitotic cells. And as you'll see towards the end of my talk, we now think that cell senescence can occur in uh, post-mitotic cells. So the cells remain metabolically active, but their metabolism changes, as you'll see in a few minutes. Uh, they're resistant to apoptosis, so that they're very difficult to kill in a sense. And the one thing that was interesting at the time was that they, different types of cells would have a certain number of population doublings that they would go through before they would essentially exit the cell cycle. And this counting was really interesting because you could take cells, for example, uh, uh, fibroblasts from uh, lung tissue would double somewhere between 50 and 60 times. And if you would take them and double, have them double for 30 times and put them back and freeze them and then thaw them out uh, months later, they would then pick up and double another 30. So they, they kind of knew how many populations double. And this was really very, very attractive. And so in 2000, in the 2000, early 2000s, Woody Wright and Jerry Shea at Dallas basically figured out the counting mechanism and it had to do with telomeres because these were somatic cells. They didn't have telomerase. So that every time they divided, they would lose a little bit of the two telomeres until the telomeres got so short that the cells would then undergo irreversible uh, uh, exit from the cell cycle and become senescence. And they showed that if they would then transfect these fibroblasts with telomerase and repair the, the uh, telomeres, that they could then double consistently. They were not transformed, but they would be normal cells and they could just keep going on and on. And so the key here was that the uh, telomere shortened induced this cellular senescence phenotype. And then they ask exactly what about the short telomeres that induce cell senescence? And it had to do with when the cell telomeres e eroded to a certain point, you would have a, a group of proteins that would mark this as a double strand break. And it was the double strand break that induced cellular senescence. And it was found that not only DNA damage, but chromatin instability, short function telomeres were all key inducers of, uh, of cell senescence. 
And so what that means is that you can have DNA damage to post-mitotic cells that can also induce uh, cell senescence. So now we know that cell senescence is not just a feature of dividing cells, but in any cell that can potentially undergo DNA damage or stress seg cell signals or oncogenes. And so what it's it come about in the 2000s is it was recognized that cell senescence, in other words, the irreversible arrest of uh, cells to no longer proliferate was an important tumor suppressor mechanism that would kind of put the, the uh, uh, halt on cells continuously prol proliferating at will. So the factors that are involved in inducing uh, uh, cell senescence that from uh, DNA damage are two pathways. One's the P21, P53 pathway and the P16 pathway. And the reason I bring this up is because markers of cell senescence that are commonly used are the upregulation or increased expression of P21 and or P16 because they're involved in activating cell senescence. In addition, Judy Campisi many years ago identified a marker of cell senescence. This is senescence associated beta gal expression. And your senescent cells have lysosomes that become accumulated with this beta gal and you can stain for this beta gal and that's kind of a, another measure of cell senescence. And what was important here was they showed that when you looked at tissues from animals or particularly human, humans, you could see increased beta gal positive or senescent cells. But the interesting thing to keep in mind here is that even though the cell senescence increases with age, even in older individuals, they make up only a small portion of the total number of cells, only one to 5%. And so the big question at this time was, well, how can so few cells have an impact on aging? Yes, they accumulate. They can accumulate in post-mitotic as well as replicating tissue. And, but what, what, how would this affect uh, aging or inflammation? And the big breakthrough was made by Judy Campisi in the uh, uh, mid 2000s when she observed this senescence associated secretory phenotype, which we call SAP. What she found was that the senescent cells were metabolically active, but their metabolism changed so that they were now expressing cytokines and chemokines and various growth factors, not only expressing the genes for them, but also secreting these proteins, for example, such as IL-6 and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so it was believed that even though you had a few senescent cells, is the cytokines and chemokines could affect the, tissue, uh, the other cells surrounding the senescent cells and would play a role in the chronic inflammation or inflammation that we observe with aging. And so in the past uh, five to 10 years, senescence, cell senescence has become a really hot topic and believed to be important in aging and potentially an aging related disease and largely through its impact on chronic inflammation. So currently, much of the research in this area now is looking at systems that essentially can uh, kill or remove senescent cells. And so now you hear talk about senolytics, and these are drugs that can selectively clear senescent cells. And uh, this has gotten to be very, very hot in the last uh, uh, five years. So currently there must be about 12 different companies that are trying to identify compounds that would be senescent. One of the leaders in this area is Jim Kirkland at Mayo. And he basically identified dasetinib and quercentin as potential senolytics. In other words, these would selectively kill uh, 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 senescent cells. And what he had shown is that if you take uh, adipose tissue from humans, and he knows that in obese humans, you have increased cell senescence. And if he cultures them in the presence of the dastatinib, 
and the quercetin, you see that there is a decrease in cell senescence in these uh, cultures. And then if you take the supernatant from these cultures, you see that there is a decrease in the uh, uh, SAS. And as you can see, IL-6 is down in this sort of thing. And so this would suggest that treating uh, an animal or even human beings with senolytics might be a way of killing or removing senescent cells. And what he showed was that uh, the uh, uh, biweekly treatment of mice, old mice with uh, these statinib and uh, quercentin, you could see an increase in lifespan and improved uh, function. So it would appear that uh, on this basis that there might be the possibility of using senolytics to counter the effects of aging. And currently, there is a great deal, as I said, a great deal of uh, uh, interest commercially in developing senolytics to treat various diseases, not so much aging right now, but to treat various diseases where it's believed that senescence may be playing an important role. And so I would say kind of keep this on the, uh, you know, think about this as something that's going to be a very hot area in aging as well as age-related diseases. Now, one of the last things that I want to mention about uh, cell uh, senescence is that it's a, an example of antagonistic pleiotropy. And this is kind of an interest from an aging standpoint because we've always, I, I've always thought, well, why does aging occur? And one of the reasons, and I think this is becoming no, no, no. more and more common, is antagonistic pleiotropy. What this means is that cell senescence evolved for an important role. It was, as I said, it's a mechanism to protect animals from cancer, but it's also we found out uh, uh, more recently that it's involved in wound healing. The senescent cells that uh, develop as the wound healing is, is cells are dividing, produce these uh, chemokines and factors that are involved in uh, wound repair. So that plays a very important role normally. But what we see is that with aging, there is an accumulation of cell senescence, either because of increased damage is that we've talked about or it could be the, the immune system is not removing cell senescence. So you have a, an accumulation of these senescent cells, which were good for you when you were young, but as you get older, they accumulate. And the argument is, is that they're producing factors that now are detrimental uh, because they, uh, rather than being uh, positive. So the next thing that I want to talk about is the dams. And this are an area uh, that we've been doing research in uh, uh, for the last five or six years. And dams are these damage associated molecular patterns. And these are generated when cells undergo necroptosis, uh, excuse me, go necrosis, where the cells burst and release the intracellular debris. And these dams then are a very strong inducer of inflammation. An example of these damps are a list of damps are shown here. And what happens is these damps, when they are released from the cells, they basically bind to the toll-like receptors on your uh, innate immune cells, such as macrophages. And this essentially induces the inflammatory response. Uh, two of the damps that are most oftentimes used to uh, measure if there's an increase in damps are HMG-B1 and mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and this, this data shows uh, from a study where they were measuring circulating mitochondrial DNA as a function of age in humans. And you can see that there is a slight increase in these circulating damps. I, although there's a great deal of variability, there's a slight increase with age. So we became interested in this uh, when we learned about necroptosis. Now this is a regulated or programmed form of uh, necrosis and it plays a major role in inflammation. The necroptosis was uh, observed, as I said, about 10 years ago when 
uh, uh, investigators were studying how TNF alpha induced cell death. And they found that uh, it was through necroptosis, but they found that it was programmed. And so the first thing that the first step in necroptosis is the phosphorylation of the protein RIP kinase 1. And the phosphorylation of this protein leads to the phosphorylation of RIP kinase 3. These form a dimer or a nucrosome. And these then phosphorylate MLKL. And this is the terminal protein in necroptosis. And the phosphorylation of MLKL leads to the oligomerization of MLKL. And the oligomers then bind to the cell membrane, disrupt the cell membranes, re releasing your damps and activating your macrophages and causing inflammation. And so, as I said, is when we entered this field, there were, it was really this, uh, this pathway had been discovered and had been shown in a variety of diseases and conditions that it was a major player in uh, uh, inflammation. And so we were interested in asking the question at that time, could it be involved in inflammation? And our thought was, is that we know with age, there's an increase in circulating TNF alpha there's increased in DNA damage, oxidative stress, mTOR activation. All of these could essentially make cells more vulnerable to undergo necroptosis and therefore uh, be a factor in inflammation. At that time, no one had looked at the role of necroptosis in aging. And so we used the marker phosphorylated MLKL as a measure of necroptosis in tissues. So we for, first focused on adipose tissue, and we were looking at nine month and old animals that were 25 to 29 month old mice. And in this case, it's black six mice. And as you can see here is in the adipose tissue, there is a dramatic increase, about a two to three fold increase in phosphorylated MLKL. But in addition, we saw that MLKL levels, phosphorylated RIP kinase levels, and RIP kinase 1 levels all were increased. So all of most of the proteins that were involved in necroptosis were upregulated with age. We were interested in whether this was a factor of aging. And so as, as uh, 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 Lakendra had told you, is I was interested in studying dietary restriction. And dietary restriction is a system where we can uh, slow down aging and we see an increase in lifespan and uh, 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 improved uh, uh, physiological functions and reduced uh, uh, pathology. This, is, this slide gives you an idea. These are on the right that you uh, left hand, you see old ad libitum fed mice. These are about 26 to 28 months of age. And on the left, you see the same age mice, but these were fed 40% uh, less calories. Uh, and as you can see is that they look younger and are more active. And so we were interested in is say, okay, if we take uh, uh, adipose tissue from dietary restricted animals, what, what do we see with respect to uh, necroptosis? And what we see is that when we essentially delay or uh, slow down aging with dietary restriction as shown in the green, we've reduced markers of uh, necroptosis, phosphorylated MLKL, as well as the other markers are all downregulated. So this got, made us really excited. And then we said, okay, we see that uh, necroptosis goes up with age. We can reduce it with dietary restriction. Is, how is this related to inflammation in the adipose tissue? And so what we looked at was we have a panel of uh, chemokines and cytokines, 60 some chemokines that we looked at. And you can see is that about a dozen of these are dramatically upregulated in old animals and it's reduced in dietary restriction. And when we look at these, the markers that we were particularly interested in that are associated with inflammation aging are IL-6, TNF-alpha and IL-1 beta. And these are increased dramatically. Ex the expression of mRNA is increased dramatically in tissues, uh, fat tissues from our old animals. And with dietary restriction, we can see that we dramatically reduce uh, the expression. And so we see 
the increase in necroptosis was paralleled by an increase in inflammation and that dietary restriction reduced necroptosis and reduced inf inflammation. We also looked at another uh, uh, anti-aging uh, intervention and that's dwarf mice. These mice also show an increase in lifespan and show various markers of uh, uh, delayed aging as well. And when we looked at uh, necroptosis in fat tissue from these mice, we again showed that necroptosis was down, inflammatory factors, including markers of macrophage inflammation were reduced uh, in these animals as well. And we've gone on to look at other tissues such as liver and such that have shown that with age, there's an increase in necroptosis and it's paralleled by an increase in uh, uh, inflammation. So finally, we looked at the role of necroptosis in neuroinflammation. And we were very interested in neuroinflammation because it's played, believed to play an important role in the age-related decline in cognition and equally important neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are oftentimes related to uh, increased neuroinflammation. And so we were interested in, based on what we had seen in other tissues, was uh, necroptosis increased in the central nervous system in the brain? Uh, and could that have some relationship to neuroinflammation? And so uh, what we've done is in this case, we've looked at uh, using imaging technology with uh, antibodies to phosphorylated MLKL. What I'm showing here is the brain section from an old animal. And as you can show in the pink here are the, going to be those cells where are expressing the phosphorylated MLKL, which would suggest these would be uh, necrotic uh, uh, cells that would be undergoing necroptosis. And you can see what was really kind of striking to me that I wasn't quite ready for, although, and that's probably because I'm not much of a neuroscientist, is that we found that it wasn't widely it was localized in certain areas. What we found in the cortex in the layer five region and in the hippo, particularly in the hippocampus in the CA3 region was areas where we saw increased necroptosis. And this shows you an example where we're looking at young animals, uh, tissue from young animals and uh, brain tissue from old animals in the uh, Upper slides is the cortex layer five. The bottom uh, is the from the hippocampus. And what we've done is we had some old animals that were uh, MLKL knockout. In other words, they don't express MLKL. And we use these as a, uh, for two reasons, this is important. This shows that the uh, staining that we have is specific for uh, MLKL, phosphorylated MLKL, but it also, will be important in a few slides. The MLKL, if we knock it out, we can show that we've essentially knocked out necroptosis, which is what we would expect and based on what people have shown in other tissues. I don't know that anyone's ever shown this in uh, uh, the central nervous system. And when we quantify this, we can see that in the cortex and in the uh, 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 hippocampus, there's about a three to four fold increase in these mar this marker for necroptosis. We've also seen other measures such as MLKL and RIP kinase 3 are also increased in this, these specific regions of the brain. So th the next question we asked was, where is the MLKL expression occurring? And in this case, we used uh, co-staining uh, with respect to phosphorylated MLKL with our marker for uh, uh, neurons, the NUN, uh, markers for microglia, I, IBA1, and markers for uh, astrocytes, GFAP. And what you see here is that we see co-localization in neurons, a little bit in uh, microglia, but no co-localization with GFAP staining. And so right now it appears that most of our MLKL, about 75% of the, excuse me, 75% of the phosphorylated MLKL are found in neurons, about 10, 15% are found in microglial. 
And as we said, we don't see any in astrocytes when we measure it by GFAP, but that's measuring just activated act, act astrocytes. So we can't say it's a general astrocyte population there. So the next question we ask here is, okay, is this increased MLKL expression associated with increased inflammation? And so what we used here is markers of I, B, uh, two markers of neuroinflammation that are oftentimes used, IBA1 uh, and GFAP. And you can see is comparing the old to the young animals. Here I'm just showing in the hippocampus, but we saw the same thing in the cortex. We can see is that there is an increase in uh, the, these two markers of neuroinflammation with age. And this just parallels what other people have been reported. Uh, so, so this is not particularly striking. But what we've shown here by, uh, in the brain as well as the other tissues is we've shown that there is an age-related increase in necroptosis as measured by phosphorylated MLKL. And we show that this is correlated with an increase in inflammation, in this case, markers of neuroinflammation. But the real question is, is this causative? In other words, uh, does this increase in MLKL is that responsible for the increase in uh, neuroinflammation that we see? And what we have here now is a, go back to our MLKL knockout mice, where we were able to prevent necroptosis. We can ask, what about, do we have any impact on neuroinflammation? And so this shows, in this case, we're showing the old MLKL knockout mice compared to the old wild type mice for the IBA, IBA1 and uh, GFAP staining. And you can see by the bar graphs in the green is that blocking necroptosis in, results in a significant decrease in neuroinflammation, suggesting that necroptosis is playing a role in uh, neuroinflammation in the old, uh, in the brains of the old mice. We did another study where we took an inhibitor of necroptosis. In this case, we took young and old animals and we took old animals, treated them with necrostatin, which reduces necroptosis. And we ask, does, what effect does that have on inflammation? Does it reduce inflammation? And this shows the uh, uh, protocol that we used. We had young and old mice treated with vehicle, and we had old mice that were treated with necrostatin for 30 days. And we showed, I won't show it, but we and others have shown this treatment results in reducing neuro uh, uh, necroptosis back to the levels that we see in the young animals. And when we looked at markers of inflammation in the hippocampus of the brain, we're looking at IL-6 and IL-1 beta here, as well as TNF-alpha, but we see no changes in TNF-alpha in the brain expression of the brain uh, with age. In, in uh, the hippocampus, we see a significant increase in IL-6 that's attenuated by necrostatin treatment. And we can see the same for IL-1 beta. So in summary, what we've shown is uh, that with, we believe what we're proposing is that because of these changes in TNF-alpha, DNA damage, oxidative stress, and mTOR activation, what we're proposing is that these conditions that occur with age make cells more prone to undergo necroptosis, leading to an increase in the release of damps, which then results in increased chronic inflammation with age, inflammaging, and this could be an important factor in aging and age-related diseases. So we're currently testing this model, and we're about halfway through this study. This is the problem of studying aging. In aging, it's, these are about four to five-year studies, but we have a cohorts aging colony of animals that are RIP3 knockout mice and MLKL knockout mice. And so we're essentially using these to essentially reduce uh, necroptosis, prevent damps, 
from accumulating with aging and asking, does that reduce inflammation? And if so, does that lead to increased lifespan and improve health and reduce pathology? So, you know, ask me back in about three years and I'll know whether uh, uh, this worked and whether this is a, a viable, in other words, if, if this study works, we would have the first evidence, direct evidence that infl altering inflammation would have an impact, a direct impact on aging. And we're also now looking at its role in other diseases. We're particularly interested in liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, because inflammation is, uh, or inflammation is an important role in that uh, disease. So in summary, what I've shown is right now it appears in my view is the two of the main players in inflammation are probably cellular senescence and necroptosis and the release of damps arising from necroptosis. It's, Important here that to recognize that we're now at a point where we can potentially start looking at uh, interventions. And as I said, is in the next five years, I think you're going to be hearing a lot about the use of senolytics to uh, uh, treat cellular senescence. And in addition, uh, studies from our lab have shown that necroptosis could be an important factor in DAMPS. And there are a variety of drugs that are available and some of them approved for use in humans uh, to uh, uh, block or reduce uh, necroptosis. It, one of the things that I didn't have time to talk about, but our latest studies suggest that there might be a relationship between necroptosis and senolytics because we've shown that when we've treated animals with senolytics, not only do we reduce cellular senescence, but we reduce necroptosis. And what we found is that when we treat animals with uh, uh, necrostatin, we essentially reduce necroptosis, but we also reduce cellular senescence. So we're really interested in it, that there may be a link between necroptosis and senolytics. And so with that, I'd like to uh, take your questions. And I just want to emphasize the people that are involved in this uh, for my group. And these are primarily the uh, necroptosis group are on the left side. Uh, 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 La Kendra, you'll recognize Dr. Deepa, who is a, a faculty member that I work closely with. Um, uh, she's a, a, a faculty member in the Department of Biochemistry. Nadish was uh, the key on doing the beautiful studies on uh, the neuroinflammation and uh, Sabra and uh, Selva are doing the studies in fat tissue and other tissues that we're looking at. So with that, I'll be happy to take uh, uh, questions.